Hi everybody, Ian Bremer here, and a quick take to kick off your week. I want to talk about things Russian. We, of course, just had an election that Putin won. Uh, there is no opposition to speak of in Russia. If you're running against him and allowed to run, that means that you are considered acceptable to the regime and you're basically there to play against the Harlem Globetrotters. What was it, the senators, the generals? I can't remember what, what it was called, but that was the group that was there to make the winning team look good. Of course, you know, Putin uh, is uh, not as much fun to watch uh, as uh, the Globetrotters, uh, but he certainly is politically talented. Uh, and of course, it's important for him to show uh, that he has an historic win with historic turnout better than anyone before in Russia, not quite Turkmenbashi levels uh, in Central Asia, not quite Aliyev levels uh, in Azerbaijan, uh, but, but strong enough for Russia. It's not just about his ego. Uh, it, it is uh, important as a messaging function uh, to the Russian people that he is seen as a legitimate leader uh, and, you know, there are others around the world that are prepared to play that game. Already saw warm congratulations from Narendra Modi uh, in India, who's strong enough domestically and geopolitically that he can say pretty much what he wants to and get away with it. Still a little sad that he felt uh, it was worth doing that. Uh, even sadder to see that from Pope Francis, who has been putting his thumb on the scale in favor of Russia vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and the war in past weeks. The Vatican tried to walk that back but uh, he was one of the first, apparently, according to Russian state media, uh, to, uh, to congratulate Putin. Normally, you wouldn't believe Russian state media, but in this case, uh, Pope Francis could very easily say that isn't true, so one assumes that it is. Um, but uh, nothing uh, good here uh, in terms of the war vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. Uh, Putin feels domestically quite stable. That's true politically. It's also true economically. There, the Russian economy is not performing well. Uh, the growth we're seeing in the Russian economy is because of the war economy, which is a massive piece uh, of uh, what the economy represents today. But they're losing uh, lots of human capital. Uh, if you look at places like Armenia, Georgia, you see that those economies are booming right now because all of the talented young Russians are leaving and they're going there to work. Great for those tiny countries, not so good for the Russian Federation. But none of this is a threat to Putin, is a threat to the Kremlin, nor is the war in Ukraine two plus years on, um, in part uh, because of the consequences if you dare oppose it publicly, in part uh, because Putin, uh, while throwing hundreds of thousands of troops uh, into the front, um, many, many of whom uh, hundreds of thousands are casualties now, um, an estimated minimum 300,000 Russian casualties in this war, but most of them are not coming uh, from the major cities. Uh, they're not even, a lot of them aren't even Russian uh, ethnically. Uh, they're coming from the middle Volga and Siberia, and they're poor and disenfranchised. And, you know, it's, uh, it's an easier way uh, for Putin uh, to keep this going. Also, large numbers um, of, uh, uh, of, of prisoners uh, that were uh, furloughed uh, and given some money uh, to be sent to the front lines, treated very badly uh, by the Russian uh, army, uh, and also uh, many that have come from other countries, including Kazakhstan, for example, Cuba, uh, Nepal, other, other countries uh, that, have, uh, that, that have sent uh, some of their citizens uh, that to make some money, to quick money, uh, and some of whom have been uh, engaged in human trafficking. So that's what's going on inside Russia. In Ukraine, um, the war continues not to go well. Uh, the Ukrainians are losing some territory. Uh, they only have one real line of defense behind the front lines. The, Ukraine, the Russians have had three. They're much better uh, dug in. Um, and also... Uh, the Ukrainians are having a serious manpower challenge, a serious ammunition challenge, and, and don't have uh, the military equipment at the high level that they really need to continue to fight. 
that is starting to change uh, for the near term. There's been more ammunition sent by the U Europeans in the past couple of weeks. Uh, and there's also, I think, increasingly very likely that the Americans will give an additional package. I'm now hearing $60 billion that should allow the Ukrainians to mostly maintain the land that they presently occupy. That's where we are for 2024. What about after that? It's only getting more challenging, not only because of the U.S. election, but also because the Ukrainians are a much smaller country and it's harder for them to raise the personnel. It's also a democracy, even though they've pushed off their elections, and it's much harder for Zelensky to get away with doing the kinds of things that Putin is doing on the ground to his own country. Um, all of which means, uh, ultimately, uh, it is hard to imagine the Ukrainians winning. It's also hard to talk about the Ukrainians winning. I, I understand that that's something that we want to do from a morale perspective. But, you know, when we talk about people that have gone through um, rape, we don't talk about winners, even if the rapist was captured and imprisoned. We talk about survivors. We talk about people that go through cancer. I guess you can beat cancer, but you're really a cancer survivor. And what's happened to the Ukrainians with the war crimes um, and the torture um, and, and that they have been through is, is survival. Uh, and, and even if they were to get all their land back, you couldn't say they won the war in reality. You say, say they survived the war and Russia's still there and they have to maintain their defenses and they have to continue um, to have the capacity to do so. And, and this is not a matter of one or two or three years. It's a matter of a generation, certainly as long as the Russian regime continues to exist in its present form. Um, I do think that it's possible for Ukraine as an entity to truly survive this war. Um, NATO allies continue to say that they have a role in NATO, that they are being welcomed, but they haven't given them a timeline. They really should, uh, and they need to provide hard security guarantees until that timeline of the remaining territory that Ukraine presently occupies. The French President Macron has been talking about that. If the Russians are able to make more gains, the Americans, the Germans have not. The Poles, the Balts certainly have. There needs to be more alignment on that in the run-up to the NATO summit meeting in July, I believe it is, in Washington, D.C. There also needs to be capacity for the Ukrainians um, to continue to pay uh, for uh, their own economic rebuilding. Uh, and that is a significant effort that right now the Europeans are providing more than the United States uh, is all in economically, and that includes the cost of military support, something we don't hear as much about as we should in the United States. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that's going to continue. And the pressure and the stress um, over time is only going to grow. But I do think that there is still such a window, and it is good to see that a strong majority of Republicans and Democrats in the United States are continuing to focus on this issue, even as the Middle East gets more time and more attention. Um, and, and that, I think, is ultimately, I mean, Trump has said very clearly he doesn't want any money or support for the border because he wants that to continue to be a, a disaster for Biden, something that people to vote for him for uh, in, up in the run up to November. But when we talk about uh, the Ukraine uh, war, Putin has not tried so hard to say no more money under Biden. Um, he's instead said, if I win, not another penny. So the pressure's there. We'll see where it goes. Uh, clearly, we are talking about a de facto partition of Ukraine, but the ability to help the Ukrainians survive this and the impact that will have on NATO more broadly and on American allies around the world, like Japan, South Korea, you name it, uh, Taiwan, uh, these are all uh, long-term, very, very important uh, precedents that are going to be set on the back of whether the Americans can indeed continue um, to stand up uh, for uh, themselves and for their allies uh, in helping the Ukrainians defend themselves. That's it for me, and I'll talk to you all real soon.